Another one just started out of the box and come back. <laughs> you didn't finish it. Uh, the families migrated then. My grandmother and two uncles and, and one aunt, they migrated to Alabama City. Of course, uh, a year or so later than our family, my mother and daddy and my two brothers and my sister and I, we migrated to Alabama City in 1920. Well, my daddy never went to work in the mill, even though my grandmother and two uncles and aunts was working in, in Dwight Manufacturing Company. But he was always in the general merchandise business. So being in general merchandise, I started out at a very young age as following my uncles and aunts around that worked for my daddy. He, he hired his kin folks to take orders. Back then, you took your orders in the morning and delivered them in the afternoon. So I would go with them to take the orders, and then I'd go back with them to deliver the orders. And I've been out as late as midnight delivering feed to make sure that the customers got their uh, feed for their cow, cattle and everything real, real late at night. And it's it just always been in the merchant business. And I grew up working in the store, too, and it was general merchandise store. Uh, Daddy handled the uh, uh, groceries and vegetables and a meat market and clothing. He sold shoes and, and dresses and overalls. And one of his leading things on Saturday to get him to come in was uh, he, could, he would get bananas and he would hang stalks of bananas all over the store and sell them 10 cents a mm -hmm. dozen. And that was my job, is to sell bananas while the rest of them came into the store to trade. Mm -hmm. And he had a tremendous trade. Uh, he just kept, at one time, well, he had the uh, grocery store in front of the court spinning mill. And he had what we call the blue front grocery store for the old rolling mill. And he bought the lever stable across the street. And uh, he uh, converted that into a 24-hour garage. So he was just a general uh, businessman of Alabama City. Well, straighten us out on something then, because some people have talked about a company store here. Well, the company store, I always thought it being a company store. Frank and Hagdens, uh was an independent store, but still you could trade there, and they would deduct it, take it out of your paycheck uh, uh, on, on Saturday. Back when I was a child, before I went to work in the mill, they worked 12 hours a day, and, and they worked till 12, 12 o'clock on, on Saturday, and they got paid in cash. Well, when I went to work at uh, Dwight Mill, and uh, I had to send off and get my birth certificate at 16. Well, NRA had gone into effect, and I was making, uh, well, I was learning to doff. At that time, I was making $8 a week, and, and we got paid uh, on Saturday in cash, but we didn't work but 40 hours a week. Now, where did you go to school? The first school I went to was the Dwight Grammar School, and I'll show you my picture when I was in the third grade. This was me in the third grade in 19 and 25. <laughs> and uh, this teacher was Miss Law, and she later married a Mr. Kemp that was manager of the A&PT company next door to the Ritz Theater. And I can name all of my grammar school teachers. My first grade teacher was Pauline Henderson. My second grade teacher was Annie Ruth Kirk. And incidentally, in the second grade is when vaccination first came out for the public schools. And I took my first vaccination in the second grade, and there was one little girl in there. Her name was a uh, uh, little uh, Irving girl, and she had had the smallpox, so she didn't have to take the vaccination. So we all envied her. <laughs> the rest of us arms was, had big old egg knots on it. So that was her. Well, now... We're interested in the in the big strike they had in 1934. You were uh, you were 16 at that time. Could you were observing it? Could you tell us what you saw? I was in high school at the time, and my mother kept. Could you, sorry, just, I was at the high school at the time of that 34 strike. Okay. Yeah, I was in high school at the time of the 1934 strike, and at the time, my mother and daddy had separated, and my mother was was working uh, for B Browns on Wall Street. And, and she was keeping borders. Most of the baseball players were Dwight Manufacturing mm -hmm. Company. And when they came out on the strike, well, uh, we, uh, at that time, just being a, a youth, well, I didn't, didn't bother me too much. I played uh, uh, rook and played checkers on, on the line with all of them that worked in the mill and all the ball players that I knew. And, and in fact, it was just a good time for me. <laughs> I didn't, I wasn't involved in the mill strike and everything, and I didn't think they had too much trouble. How did it affect your daddy's business? 
It, it affected his business a, a, a great deal. Uh, it affected my father's grocery business. It affected my father's grocery business so, so, so much, but not uh, all that much. They weren't out all that long. Well, they they had to eat, so they still got their groceries on credit. And so they, Daddy let them have it on, on, on a bill. And, of course, he never got all the bills paid. He, he died with some of the bills still owing to him. You know, I say it wasn't out for long, but they were out for 13 weeks. And when you are really poor, that must have really been a strain on your daddy to carry all those people. I'm sure it was, but being a youth, I didn't realize it. Uh, too, well, we had a big garden and a cow, and most, most of them, uh, they cut out on their grocery bill. In other words, they all had cows, and they all had gardens, and, and it didn't take much for us in those days. We, we managed. Uh, okay. Uh, let's see. Now, uh, another thing that we should talk about in the schools, I noticed in your autobiography, we want to try to get something of the kind of moral climate of the, of the village, which I gather was fairly strict. You mentioned in your autobiography that there was a fence between the girls and the boys thing. Could you talk about that? Uh, yeah, the three-story white school building I went to, well, the, at the end of the big three-story building was the... was the bathroom, so to speak, and, and on the right side was the, the girls went in there, on the left side the boys, and the fence went right on down to the ditch. So the girls played on the right side, the boys played on the left side. And, and uh, we had plenty of swings and, and bars and everything to play on, but our, our main games that we played was capturing the flag and uh, run sheep run and cowboy and Indians. And uh, I always liked to be on the toughest guy in the school side to, uh, to be on the cowboy side and two it was in in those days if i had a fight on the school ground and i got whipped well the teacher's gonna whip us too and then when i got home i would get three whippings but fortunately i didn't lose too many fights on the school ground so i didn't get but two about two whippings when i got, got into a fight and you have a pamphlet there tell us about it this pamphlet, I'm not sure just exactly when Dwight Manufacturing Company put this pamphlet out, but I think it was around 19 and 12. And I think they were still, it's a public relationship pamphlet that they, that they carried out and passed around to people on Sand Mountain, Lookout Mountain, and other cities nearby that would help their public relations to get them to come work at Dwight. Mm -hmm. But they did have a lot to offer in this pamphlet. They had good, uh, good housing and good sanitary mm -hmm. condition, good climate in good working conditions, and, and they did, Dwight, to my opinion, was good to their employees that they did uh, uh, furnish their church and their preachers and furnish their schools and that thing. And, uh, Maybe you could read some of it to us, huh? Yeah, you might just flip through it and read some of the headings. Can I show you this picture? Mm -hmm. This village boarding house is, is, was in a well-known place in the 30s. It, it's where boarders that worked in Dwight Manufacturing Company lived. That's also where Ben Stewart lived before he married. That was the police uh, traffic that mm -hmm. rode the motorcycle. But this building burned in 1927. Well, my grandfather just had built a new uh, grocery store on Canterbury for my father. And he led me with my hand. I was about nine years old around. And, and I held his hand while we watched this boarding house burn mm -hmm. to the ground. Mm -hmm. And I understand that there was Mr. and Mrs. Adams that took care of this boarding house into those days, and it burned to the ground. Mm -hmm. They never rebuilt it. In this same spot later on where well, there would be skating rinks coming, and they built a cafe there, and the skating rink would come down, maybe stay three or four months, and then move to another place, and maybe a little carnival uh, merry-go-round and swing and the Ferris wheel had put out there and then they'd move on somewhere else. That is on the corner of uh, Wall Street and Kyle Avenue in those days. Now you, because your father was a merchant and but you had worked in the mill a bit yourself and your parents, had, your grandparents had worked in the mill, you are in a position to tell us kind of in a way, in a kind of neutral way, attitudes here. What was the general attitude towards uh, labor organization in the town at the, uh, in the early 30s? 
in the early 30s to me, I was busy in school and playing ball and everything, and, and I didn't get too much attitude toward any union. It just never entered, entered, entered my mind. Nobody never spoke about it. Looking back on it now, could you draw any conclusions about it? Well, I've heard talk, but I, I can't draw any conclusion. I, the, I've heard talk, and, and I think uh, the most talk it really came after Dwight sold the mill to Cone. I think their problem was with Cone and not with Dwight Manufacturing mm -hmm. Company, as far as I can tell. Uh, there was a sheriff here. Okay. Uh, we just pick up that noise. That's <laughs> all. Yeah. Uh, there was a... There was a uh, no, but you told me that you, that that I was wrong about that sheriff. I believe. Um, let's see, uh, Judy, do you have something that's uh, on your list there? Uh, George Harris was a chief of police mm -hmm. during that time, mm -hmm. and and of course my daddy had been an alderman of the police department. Well, everything seemed to be fine as far as I could tell. Mm -hmm. So, because we get contrary uh, reports. Uh, for example, uh, a little while ago, Mr. Uh, Ware said that there was no violence during the strike. Uh, some other people have told us about turning over cars. Uh, could you remember any of that? No, I couldn't. I mean, that just wasn't my cup of tea in those days. I, I did play rook, and I played checkers yeah. on, at what we call the back gate. In fact, it was just a grow between where I lived and the back gate. It's one I went in the back gate when I worked there, but uh, I didn't see any uh, anything like that going on. But I'm I'm not surprised that it didn't up at the front gate and the mm -hmm. cold gate. Mm -hmm. Did you hear anything about guns? Did you see any guns uh, down there? I probably did see a gun or two carried around, but I never seen any of them used. I mean, I think some of them just carried them for protection. Mm -hmm. What about clubs? And clubs. On any strike picket line, well, you'll find clubs and guns, I'm sure. You may not be able to see them, but I'm sure they're there. Okay, okay Judy? Yeah, what kind of strike was that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Were they clubs or picker sticks? Yeah. No, that, I think. Sir, you, as I say, represent a lot of uh, Southern people who are making big local collections. Uh, tell us about it and why you do it and uh, what you've got here. Well, you might say I started out for my own uh, descendants to know what, what happened in the past as well as anybody. I, really, my wife talks about this often. We talk about it. If we don't do it now and leave it, Leave it. We we be able to give a, a, a copies of anything we got to anybody where it will be handed down, and everybody will really understand our our path. I'd like to call one attention to this third grade picture of me. Uh, what did I do with it? This is me in the third grade, and the reason I want to call your attention to that. Well, when I was in the third grade, well, ever Mother's Day, we call it May Day, well, we had a big uh, outing, an athletic outing, a big meeting at, at what uh, was just not too far from the Dwight School. And uh, in the third grade, I always did the Maypole dance. And the teacher paired us off with, with, with a girl, whether you liked the girl or not. So that was a big event in grammar school. It's when you reached the third grade and got to do the maypole dance. And that was always done on, on uh, May the 12th. And May the 12th was Mother's Day. And in the beginning, well, what a lot of people don't know, that every governor in, in the United States designated May the 12th, 19 and 12, was Mother's Day. That's when Mother's Day started. Mm -hmm. and, and you just had the one red carnation. You didn't have a red and a white mm -hmm. flower. That is the beginning of Mother's Day, and that's why our Dwight School picked that up to be our May Day. And they had all kind of athletic events on that. They had uh, pole vaulting, uh, sack racing, potato racing, egg, egg racing, and, and, and what have you. And that was a big day in, in grammar school. And another big event in grammar school was the 4th of July. It's the same principle. We lined up. Teachers paired us off with a girl for a partner. We all had our American flags, and we left the Dwight School and went down through the mill village. We went down Peach Tree, we went down Comnock, we went down Lakefront, we went down Fourth Street to Forest Avenue, 
back to Wall Street, and back to Dwight Avenue, back to the school, waving our American flags and singing uh, patriotic songs. And, and it was very patriotic. I mean, the people in the South were very patriotic when I was in grammar school. What pamphlets do you have there? Uh, this pamphlet here was put out by the Chamber of Commerce uh, is Greater Gadsden, and it's uh, really it just a big event that happened in 1940. And uh, right here is a map of Greater Gadsden. And this is to invest in public with the Gadsden Development Company, W.C. Ford, the president, F.L.M. Brister, vice president and general manager, and A. M. Treadwell, Secretary and Treasurer, and this was put out for uh, the Chamber of Commerce to really attract industry to come to Gadsden. And at that time, they were attracting industry. I mean, they had brick yards and lumber companies and stove foundries and pipe shops and steel plants, cotton mills, and, and what have you. It was really had the possibilities to grow. I guess we lost out on politics. Maybe we didn't have the politicians in that we should have. We, at one time, we were much larger than Huntsville. What's, what's that? Th this is the first book that Goodyear put out. This is Working in Unity for the Industry of the South by the Goodyear Tire and Rubber Company of Akron, Ohio. And they announced to come here in 1928. In 1929, Thursday, July 11, 1929, they had the formal opening at the Southern Goodyear plant. And uh, they also had nearby, it, it, in Cedartown, a cotton mill that made uh, fiber to go into the tires. And at one time, it was the largest rubber plant in the world. And they have sent uh, trained men all over the world to run other mm -hmm. rubber plants. <laughs> and this is one that was put out in 1938 by the, by the garden clubs. It was written and published by the Department of Archives and History of the Women's Club of Gadsden, and it covers the music clubs, the garden clubs, and it's got a lot of interesting things about our schools, our libraries, our hospitals, our hotels, our newspapers, our theaters, our radios, and recreation and sport. It's just, just a very interesting book to read, and they, they put them out so often. I have several of them. I don't know which way. Well, you've read a lot of those. Uh what was their chief? Uh, what was the chief attraction of coming to to Gadsden, Alabama City? The chief attraction to me was the low uh, tax rate, the low tax rate, and in, in the climate and uh, the location. Was there, uh, what about the um, the wage rates? The wage wage rate. Well, the wages was like all other meals in those days, but still Dwight offered them uh, a good uh, house rent and good, uh, uh, all kind of uh, good uh, things. In other words, they paid their preachers and they kept their church and they paid for all the schools, everything except the teachers. In other words, they paid for building the schools, they paid for the upkeep of the schools, and, and of course they did have a board of education which took care of the uh, paying the teachers. Outside that, Dwight would take care of the school system and, 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 and the churches. So you can't beat that. <laughs> this book here is on Gulf State Steel. And they first, I say Gulf State Steel, uh, they were first the Southern Iron and Steel Company. And Gulf State brought them out. And then later, Republic Steel. It was Republic Steel that I worked for for 35 and a half mm -hmm. years. And then they sold to LTV. And then later, LTV sold it to Brendan Corporation, and they still having a little problem about the about the smush and stuff coming mm -hmm. from the plants that was not in contract that they still in lawsuit about. Which mm -hmm. uh, maybe I better not say it, but I think Brendan got a pretty good price in buying that plant because the plant was really, really worth yes. something. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, this is the record. But my payroll, I don't know, I was fortunate enough to run across this. When I worked at Dwight Manufacturing Company for three months, this gives the amount I made in three months. And of course, at that time, they had what they call uh, spare hands, that they would just work when somebody would take off. So you could tell I didn't make very much in a, a quarter. My name here and rate is $134.06 for three months' work. What year was that? 
that was in 1937. That was right at, that was the year after I finished high mm -hmm. school. Now, do you remember when uh, the Roosevelt came in? I remember uh, when uh, just before Roosevelt had come up. I mean, the main political set on the corners of Alabama City was stand him on his head and stand him on his feet. Hoover, Hoover can't be beat. So we all went through the Hoover <laughs> administration, but. Uh, but Roosevelt was pretty well popular in, in the South. I mean, I think he went in with landslides, you know, and bring back prosperity. They sing Hello, Dolly, and bring back, uh, and he inserted the NRA, which helped uh, help the wage earners. It helped me. That's about the time I went to work, and uh, it helped me. I made $15 a week, and a penny out of that dollar went to the doctor, and we had good doctor for, for 15 cents a week. I had good doctor care and nurse care that Dwight uh, mm -hmm. earned. So I think Dwight was real good to the employees myself. Do you remember uh, the first time you heard uh, uh, Franklin D. Roosevelt? Yeah, I remember coming on the radio and said, my wife, Eleanor, she don't want no war, and I don't want no war. <laughs> and at that time, I was in the National Guard. I knew I was headed for war. And I spent five years in the service during World War II, from 1940 to 1945, and three major campaigns in the South Pacific. But uh, back to the, when, uh, Roosevelt had something to call fireside chats. Do you remember listening to him when you were a kid on the radio? I sure did. Uh, everybody had a radio and everybody tuned in on his, fire, his chats. He sure did as well as listening to Amos and Andy, and Lum and Abner, and Will Rogers, and others. Mm -hmm. That was the thing in those days. Okay, Judy. Yeah, um, can I sit there? Mm-hmm, sure. Um, but for us to know, you know, to know, you know, the, for you to remind us, you know, that I lived in the Mill, mill Village, my dad, and reach for anything that's going to be useful. Yeah. Oh. Stop. Absolutely, yeah. Ready? Well, go ahead and start. You want, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay, now this picture is, is very important to me because uh, in uh, in the Mill Village, well, in, in Burns' Cox's home, well, he had a, a nephew, a brother, and two nieces, and they were all my close friends. And in their yard, we had a, a trolley with an automobile tire in it. And we would get up in a high tree and get in that tire and ride it down to the bottom. And that was, uh, it was the girls and the boys. It was Inez, Kitty, and uh, Percy, and R.T., and myself. We, I would spend all day playing in their yard. And then just one block down, well, they had a aunt that had some girls, Bob Lee Carey and, 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 and her sisters and brothers, and we would play in their yard. There's only room to play one-eyed cat. We'd have one base. We'd play string ball. We'd hit the ball, and we would run to one base and run back to the other. And then on that same street, they were the, the Johnsons and the Buck Cannons and the Cartees. Well, you had to go through the Cartees yard going walking to Dwight School, and that was our marble yard. And we would shoot marbles in that yard all day long. When we weren't in school, of course, we'd spend our Saturdays shooting marbles in their yard. And incidentally, in those days, well, there was no such thing as asking for a cookie or a Coca-Cola or, or a cup of coffee or something like that. The mother might, you could go around and back and get you a drink of water, but we never thought of eating any refreshments at a friend's house. I mean, we had water and that was it. Nobody ever come to our house wanting to, uh, 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 some refreshments or something. It, it just wasn't the thing in, in those days. Let's start again. Jenny, okay. Okay. My daddy was always in the general merchandise business as well as having a, a all 24-hour garage. In other words, my brother operated gas tanks, and I'd stay up there with him at night. Just I'd sleep on the cushion just to be with him. And he had a bunch of mechanics working for him, as well as having three grocery stores at one time. So I have been in Ever Mill Village in, in, in Dwight, Mill Village at one time or the other because just about all of them traded with my daddy. Okay. You know what? Excuse me. You want to be in the. Um, are we running? Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now listen. You know what? You, you 
look all closed up like you're mad at me. Are no, you mad I'm not at me? mad. All right, I'm well, mad. loosen up. Okay. Now you tell me about your father. Well, my father then in the general merchandise business, I could say that I have been in every house in the Dwight Mill Village at, at one time or the other. And, and we would go every morning with uh, one of them that is his duty to take orders and take their orders. And then we would go back to the store and then we would fill those orders and deliver them in the afternoon. And they would do that every day. In other words, the lady that was left in the house, such as, as Mama T. Ma Cox, would give the order every morning for her family because she did have a large family living there. And, and we would deliver it that afternoon. And then uh, a lot of them wouldn't have to buy their cottonseed hulls and meal for their cows except once a week. And they would generally order that on Friday and we would deliver it on Saturday. So I would go back and deliver their cow feed on Saturday real late. And uh, it's just, uh, I don't, I remember them building some new houses, and uh, that was when I was in World War II. And they may be one or two that I hadn't been in, but they, there's not many houses in that mill village that I hadn't been in. And I knew all of the families, too, because I went to school with all of them. I went to school with all of them. I knew all of them by name. Back then, you knew everybody. I could stay in front of the post office on Wall Street, and I could name you everybody that come down Wall Street. Or in high school, when, when they built Emerson Sanson High School, it was built for 400 people, and I can name you everybody in that school. Of course, I don't think they could do that now. But it... Can you name a bunch of families on one street? Okay. Okay, you ch which street are we going to do? Oh, Let's well, do where well, Burns Cox family well, live. Um, where did T-Mama live? Oh, that was on Hensdale Street. Okay, start with, now T-Mama, Burns Cox's mother, she lived on blah 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 and then you tell me all the families that you didn't play, That's how you played that. That's really asking me hard right yeah. now. Okay. Uh, I, well, you could miss a couple. I'm yeah, really I, I can remember on this street, Grady Kilgore lived on that street. I can remember another on that street uh, was uh, Hoyt Kaysen lived on that street. And I, I remember uh, Arnold Bolden living on that street. You don't know what street you're talking about? I'm talking about Hensdale Street. Okay, so you start Hensdale now Street. on Hensdale Street. And, and uh, the Shrums lived on that street, and, and Shrum was a uh, superintendent of the spinning room. And he lived on that street, and uh, well, that's quite a bit on that. But on the next street over was Comnock Street, and I remember on Comnock Street, well, uh, the Buckhannons lived on the corner. Next door was the Hollands. Next door was the Cartees. Across the street from that was the Barfields, and then across from them was the Jacobs, and and next door to them was the Johnsons. I can remember that many on Comnock Street. Okay. Now, I need for you to look at me. I know when you remember, when you're in, can you start off a sec? Albert Street was what we called Boss's Street. And the very first house was S.L. Long. And his son was uh, Ed Long and L.J. Long. And then they had some sisters that I can't recall their name right now. But then they had uh, uh, Perkins. He was the boss of the cloth room. And then they had uh, Ben Turner. He was the boss of the card room. And then, of course, across, just one big globe area over there was the agent house. And the only agents that I remember in my lifetime was uh, Alan Little and Thomas Cousins and Charles Moody. That's the only three agents I remember. There may have been more, but I, I just don't remember. Could you tell us what the agents did? And if you could, could you shut it off a second? No. Gar, I would sneak no, in his orchard and, wait, and wait, get his apples wait, and peaches. Wait, wait, we want you to say I didn't know the. Uh, I knew all the the bosses. I knew uh, all the most of the supervisors, but I didn't know. The Actually, I didn't know any of the agents personally, but I knew all of them, and I knew where they lived because I had been around their place many times. In other words, the scout troop was right down below where the agents lived, and it was a two-room Boy Scout. And I was a mascot. I didn't get to join the Boy Scouts until I was twelve years old. But I have been in the agents' orchard. I had been in his. When I was a kid, I had been in his peaches and his apples and everything, but I didn't actually know him personally. But I did know the supervisors and, 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 and their families and, and everything pretty well. And I think the reason they put out this book uh, was that, uh, that they maybe just hitched up a horse to a buggy and gave uh, some of the men these little books to go out. In fact, go right up this Tabor Road about five to ten miles, and you'd be surprised at the number of people that live 
10 miles up this Tabor Road that went and worked at Dwight Manufacturing Company through reading this book. And uh, one other thing that did happen to me about uh, when I was going into all the houses in the mill village, well, my brother and I, we were on the back of a 34 pickup truck, and he had a BB gun, and he shot one of the, one of the Dwight workers on the leg about three blocks from the store. Well, of course, they knew who he was. In time, we got back to the store, well, they knew, Daddy already knew that it was my brother that did it, and he carried him into the feed store and whipped him real good. And he, I don't remember him ever shooting anybody else with a BB gun while out delivering groceries. 